In this episode, I would like to continue our approach to conditions associated with noisy breathing in children. I wanted initially to discuss them together with epiglottitis, but uh, first because the epiglottitis ended up having a very important and high yield algorithmic approach that deserved its own episode. And second reason, because the three conditions that I wanna discuss in this episode have a very important uh, common feature in their radiologic imaging, I decided to discuss them together. So this episode focuses on the differential diagnosis of conditions associated with subglottic stenosis. Uh, these three conditions are bacterial tracheitis, croup, and diphtheria. So there are several ways to address this differential diagnosis. For example, bacterial tracheitis has very similar features to epiglottitis. On the other side, um, croup is perhaps the only one among these that is responsive to racemic epinephrine and is not associated with um, a membrane. So again, the subglottic uh, conditions associated with formation of membrane include bacterial tracheitis and diphtheria. Both of these are non-responsive to racemic epinephrine. And so these are together a very important differential diagnosis. And because of this, I thought it's worth discussing them together while most other methods discuss croup with epiglottitis, even though the age range or the clinical presentation are totally different. With this background, let's turn our attention to this discussion. First question, what are the clinical presentation or signs symptoms of bacterial tracheitis? A young child, almost the same age group of that of croup, that's three months to three years in the case of croup and three months to two years in the case of tracheitis, has uh, upper respiratory prodrome, but this is followed by sudden decompensation and strider. Please remember that in the case of croup, we do not have this sudden decompensation or strider. We have mainly hoarseness, though respiratory distress is possible in the course of croup. As you can read here, I'm clearly indicating that this is opposite to the more gradual prodrome or complication in the course of croup that happens in around a week. In the course of tracheitis, we have just a couple days followed by sudden deterioration. Now, do you remember any other condition that has this two-step manifestation among the respiratory infections of toddlers? Yes, remember respiratory syncytial virus also begins with a prodrome of upper respiratory tract infection. But the next step is not the symptoms of upper airway obstruction with strider. The next step is a picture of kind of pneumonia or wheezing in the case of respiratory syncytial virus. So then the question is how we differentiate tracheitis from epiglottitis. Remember one is the, this uh, tracheitis has again, as I mentioned, has a prodrome and therefore has a slower onset than that of epiglottitis. The second very important distinctive feature is the presence of secretions, usually thick secretions that can form a kind of pseudomembrane in the pharynx covering, for example, the tonsils and upper pharynx. Now remember, the presence of these secretions is indicative of what pathogen it indicates the uh, Staphylococcus aureus is the underlying cause, and that is usually happens in a bit older kids, kids at the age five to eight years. What is the hallmark of chest X-ray assessment of these patients? As I mentioned in the beginning of this episode, we are dealing with subglottic stenosis. How is this condition managed? The management is similar to that of epiglottitis with the same indications for intubation. For example, if the patient is deteriorating. Also, the antibiotic regimens are similar and that include third generation cephalosporin. And if indicated, we need to add vancomycin for MRSA. Uh, the alternative again being clindamycin. If you are asked uh, about the response to racemic epinephrine, as opposed to the positive response in croup, here we do not have response to racemic epinephrine. Okay, moving to croup. What is it? It is an acute infection of larynx, trachea, or bronchi, including uh, the alternative name of laryngotracheobronchitis. 
most commonly by white pathogen, most commonly mediated by parainfluenza type 1, more than types 2 and 3, but other respiratory viruses such as influenza virus, adenovirus, or RSV could be the culprit. What is the age that helped us distinguish it specifically from epiglottitis? The age that's common for croup is six months to three years. What are the symptoms that uh, could help distinguish it from epiglottitis? We have a couple symptoms that are present here that are absent in epiglottitis, and those are mainly barking cough that is worse at night plus hoarseness. Um, in epiglottitis, we have drooling, we have tripod or sniffing position, and we have strider. Here we have no drooling, the fever is usually low, and therefore we say that the kid is not toxic, um, and uh, there is usually no specific position that the kid obtains. True or false diagnosis of croup requires uh, x-ray confirmation. That's false diagnosis is mainly clinical, however, x-ray confirmation can show the specific stipple sign indicating subglottic narrowing. What modality we use? We do not use a lateral x-ray, we use anteroposterior x-ray for subglottic stenosis assessment. True or false stipple sign has high sensitivity or specificity, specificity for croup. That's false again because it is a common finding in uh, conditions associated with subglottic stenosis. Now, what is the treatment for croup? The very first step is stratification of patient's symptoms into mild, moderate to severe. If the patient is mild, we can treat the patient with just humid air, uh, cool mist, and we may consider corticosteroid treatment. Now, what is the best index of severity? Presence or absence of uh, strider, uh, which indicates some uh, compromise of the upper airway or presence or absence of respiratory distress. Any of these, especially at rest, indicates uh, severe. If they are just present, indicates moderate severity. What is the management for these conditions? We add oxygen supplementation and consider nebulized racemic epinephrine. Again, if we do not have response to these management, what's the next step? Based on the standard uh, indications, we consider uh, endotracheal intubation. What is the complication possible for croup? That is tracheitis that we just discussed. And we again move to our final differential of subglottic stenosis due to infectious etiology and that's diphtheria. It's not very common um, due to virus spread vaccination. Now moving on to diphtheria, what is the common case presentation if you get to see any of them ever? Uh, usually we are dealing with an unvaccinated, unimmunized child with toxic appearance, that's prostration and some degree of respiratory distress with uh, symptoms a bit similar to that of croup, but uh, they are worsening gradually. Again, many of the shared features such as hoarseness, sore throat, and respiratory distress could be present. So what are the features that help differentiate diphtheria? One is the child is unvaccinated, makes it similar to epiglottitis risk factor. The second thing is there is a white gray membrane in the posterior pharynx. The hallmark of this membrane is if it's scraped, it will bleed. That would help differentiate it from the pseudomembrane formed by the thick secretions of Staphylococcus aureus in the case of bacterial tracheitis. The third feature is the symptoms due to toxin production. So remember the respiratory symptoms are due to direct invasion of the respiratory epithelium, but we have two set of symptoms due to the diphtheria toxin. One is the cardiac uh, symptoms, any type of cardiac abnormality from arrhythmia, to um, uh, myocarditis. And in the case of uh, neurologic involvement by the toxins, always remember the top of the list are those symptoms of cranial nerve or bulbar palsy, such as dysphonia, diaplopia, and dysphagia. What do you expect to see in the imaging of diphtheria? Again, evidence of subglottic narrowing. Uh, remember that the treatment is with erythromycin. However, there are a couple important points that I believe worth mentioning in the course of uh, management of diphtheria. 
Uh, one is we should not wait for the culture confirmation because the moment the patient is suspected to have diphtheria, for example, by the presence of a gray-white scrapable bleeding uh, membrane in the posterior pharynx, we need to initiate treatment and the first line is antitoxin that is to be provided even earlier than the macrolide antibiotic. The second point is what next is required in terms of public health consideration. Remember, diphtheria is a reportable disease. It should be reported to the local public health authorities. All the patients should be admitted and also receive antibiotic on admission. What's the course? Uh, macrolide or anti uh, penicillin usually four times a day for two weeks. Now, if the patient begins to demonstrate symptoms of airway obstruction, what is the management? We need to consider removal of that membrane under direct laryngoscopy. And finally, what is the post-exposure prophylaxis for the patients uh, uh, around the diphtheria case? For the unimmunized, we uh, provide the vaccination and a course of antibiotics. Remember any one of the other conditions that required post-exposure prophylaxis, that was epiglottitis for the unimmune patients. And this finishes our discussion of the three important differential diagnosis of subglottic stenosis.